Thank you. I know. I know. Believe me. I know. I get it. Thank you. Ah, thank you. All right. That's annoying now. Yeah. Jeez, thank you. This is what I look like. <laughs> thank you for coming out tonight. Very excited to be down here in Solano Beach. Been here before. Hasn't changed one bit. Same ocean. Same ocean. Same people. Nice people. Anybody live here or are you coming from other places? That's a real excited crowd right there. That was a lot. Almost blew me right off the stage with that. I was talking to some woman out front earlier. Uh, I didn't know who she was. Fan. And, uh, she, um, it's one of these people that announces that she's a hugger before she leaves. You ever get those people? I'm a hugger. I said, I'm a kisser. <laughs> All of a sudden, she wasn't a hugger. <laughs> How am I doing on time? <laughs> Another nice hand for Kirk Fox, who was out here earlier. I think you remember him. You ever see a walk on the beach out here? He usually walks on the beach out there. Uh, this is kind of a sad um, anniversary for me. 27 years ago, and don't laugh, I'm not a cat person, but I had this cat. He was the best cat ever. He wasn't like all these other cats, standoffish or whatever. He was like a dog. He was just like, when I had friends come over, he would hug up against them, you know? And he would sit on my lap all the time and he'd purr. I love that cat. Got him from a homeless guy in New York City. Um, all he was eating was um, tomato sauce. That's what he was feeding him. I said, can I have your cat? Can I take him and give him a good home? He goes, no, no, it's my cat. I said, how about 20 bucks? He goes, he's yours. Take him. <laughs> True story. And uh, I had a pair of jeans that this cat loved. Every time I was wearing these jeans, and they were great jeans, they fit me perfect. You ever have a pair of jeans like that? I mean, you don't, you know, you keep them for a long time, and they're worn out in the, the right areas, and they hug the ass. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> when I put those jeans on, he would get on my lap, and he would not get off of my lap. He just loved those jeans, probably more than I did. And when he died, it was very upsetting, I decided that I would bury him in those jeans, you know? So I thought maybe in some way he would like it. So I wrapped him up, put him in the hole, and buried him, buried him with those jeans on. And um, it was sad. And every once in a while, um, he was a great cat. I got it today, the anniversary, every once in a while I get this wave of sadness washing over me because I really miss those jeans so much. You know, I really, I really, I really regret putting those jeans in the hole with him. <clears throat> he didn't care. It wouldn't matter to him either way. To me it mattered because I love those jeans. I wore them a lot. You know what I mean? <laughs> I was just thinking about this. You ever do anything for yourself? You know what I mean? Just nobody else is watching and you just do it. You're your own audience. <clears throat> Excuse me, a little residual COVID there. Yeah, it's, not, it's not enough to kill you, but it'll mess you up pretty good. So, um, I, I go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. They have the uh, Starry Night there, painting by Vincent van Gogh. And, uh, and here's what I like to do. It's the only painting on the wall. Like a hundred people around it, taking pictures. I like to work my way up to the front of the crowd, I give the woman next to me saying, is this a famous painting? <laughs> it is. How much are they selling it for? <laughs> That's a lot of money. It's not that really good of a painting, is it? What are you, it's a lot of, is it an adult or a child painting? Because it looks like a kind of a finger painting thing. I see. Is it the frame that makes it so expensive? <laughs> because I have a, I got a painting that would look great in that frame. I mean, really, it really make that frame pop, you know. I don't know if you've seen this painting. It's four dogs playing poker on the table. It's, it might be a print, I'm not sure. But, uh, but that's a nice, uh, and then she huffed off. She goes, ah, that's like not knowing who the Mona Lisa is. I said, I got the Mona Lisa frame. I got the frame for the Mona Lisa. I know who he is. I know who she is. He, she. Here's another thing I like to do. And then I gotta get out of here, for God's sakes. <laughs> I like to go to a dinner party. This is my favorite thing. And um, halfway through the dinner party, I excuse myself. I come back five minutes later, and loud enough for the other guests to hear, I say to the host, 
do you have a plunger? <laughs> A plunger and a mop. If you have a mop, <laughs> yeah, just little stuff like that. Yeah, I have a lot of fun doing that. Guys, we're gonna have a good time tonight. We're gonna have a great time tonight. Whoa, 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 whoa! Not here. Not here. Jesus Christ. Jeez. You know, some people aren't happy with what they have in life. I've noticed that. Even the Solano Beach, just some people, eh, I'm not happy down here. Oh, that makes me so angry. You know? I know of a guy, he has sex twice a day. He reads three books a week and he's always working out. And yet here he is still complaining about being in prison. You know? <laughs> What's up with that? I don't get it. I do not get it. You gotta be positive in life. You know, you gotta look for the good stuff. Be optimistic. When someone calls me and they say, hey, I got good news, I got bad news, what do you want to hear first? I say, the good news, of course. They tell me the good news. And then I hang up. <laughs> Why would I want to hear the bad news? No. Oh. Look for the good, look for the out. I like it when, when I see an adult wearing braces, it makes me happy. It does, because I know they have hope for the future. You know what I mean? I love that. <clears throat> Oh, I forgot to tell you this. I totally forgot to tell you this. I was gonna tell you as soon as I came out. I'm so angry. <laughs> I had an Uber driver this morning. He's texting and driving the whole way. It made me furious. You know how I get. Oh, I'm so angry. And I didn't say anything to him because I hate confrontation. I really do. I, I avoid it at all costs. But I texted him from the back seat. <laughs> So you better stop texting and driving right now. Capital letters, five poop emojis at the end, the darkest ones I can find. And then a smiley face emoji because I'm a people pleaser when it comes down to it. I gotta scale back on the emojis, I'm getting lazy. You know, I'm gonna forget how to write pretty soon. Had a good time with you yesterday. Happy face emoji. Okay, I see what he's saying. Okay, it's a good thing you put the happy face there. I wouldn't know what he was saying other than that, you know? <laughs> People don't use emojis during regular conversation, do they? Hey, I had a really good time with you yesterday. <laughs> but your sister is crazy. <laughs> but no, seriously, the, uh, the whole um, texting and driving thing, people die from that. I mean, I do it because I'm a good driver, I'll be honest with you. I know I can handle the road, I can do, you know, multitask and stuff, but other people shouldn't be doing it. My peripheral vision is astounding. Am I right, the people sitting over here? Yeah, see, I told you. Sometimes I'll be texting and driving, I'll be down on it, I'll look up, I'm in a different city. What? How did that happen? I don't know. I don't get angry over a lot of stuff, but I hate Amber Alert. You know what I mean? It's so annoying. It goes off in your phone, it scares you to death out of nowhere. Look, Tiffany's lost, we can't find her. Well, look for her first before you call me. You know what I mean? I'm not going to join the posse. Don't get the posse together yet. Jesus Christ, I don't call you when I can't find my car keys, do I? No. They never tell you when they find the kid, either. They never call you and say, hey, we found him. No, they don't. I've been looking for a, a Jason for the last 20 years. <laughs> Turns out he's my dentist. How's it going in the front row here? Why, why, you know, why do people sit in the front row in a comedy club? Uh, but I guess they'll always be in front row. Somewhere, huh? I do look great, you're right about that. How about now, how's your neck? How's your neck now? What's up, boss? How are you guys? You guys have been married for quite a while, haven't you? What's your name? Carol. John and Carol. They're like European names, huh? <laughs> Carol, how long have you been with John? You recognize him still? <laughs> that is John, right? Have you, are you married? Yeah, how long have you been married, Carol? 
A long time. I didn't think it was that long. Is it a long time? Oh. 20 years. Good for you. Where did you meet this guy, John? DC. What were you doing in DC, Carol? Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> What were you doing in D.C.? What were you doing where you met John in D.C.? You were working there as a president or as a... Public radio did? Oh, those are the... Did you have to get people to donate money at PBS? That's the worst job ever. Not yours, but... And John, tell me about yourself. How did you meet Carol? She was working in D.C. You happened to be in D.C. on a business trip, no? <laughs> what happened? You were what? You were, I'm sorry, John. This audience is very, very impolite. <clears throat> you were working. John, try to put your thoughts together. Use your indoor voice. So you were. Well, I'm trying to help you here, John. I'm just trying to help you as a person. You went to a singles event, and the music was so terrible, so you left. <laughs> you went to a bar. That's the best story I've ever heard. And a good story. You don't go online. You don't do the dating stuff, do you? No, that was not your thing, or not your time. And then you hit it off at the bar, a couple of drinks, and one thing leads to another. Any kids? No. No? Okay. Good for you. Really well that night. Carol, do you think that John is your soulmate? <laughs> Take a good look at him. Take a good look at him. I'm a little, uh, this whole soulmate thing, I'm a little sus about that. What is the likelihood of you meeting your soulmate out of the billions and billions and billions of people in the world at some singles event in DC out of all the billions of people, Carol? Carol, I'm, you know, I don't want to upset you, but your soulmate probably lives on the other side of the world someplace. I mean, when you think about it, right? That person who would be perfect for you, that person who would adore you and just think of you all the time and not complain like John does all the time. Probably. But unfortunately, you probably never meet that person. So you settle for John, I get it, I get it. John, you live here in Solano? Where do you live? You live in Mexico, Rosarito Beach? How often do you come over the border? You've left another country to come and see me? If things get bad enough here, you're moving out of here? Well, give me like at least a half hour. <laughs> It takes a little time. It takes a little time for me. Warm up. You know that I met my wife at a costume party one Halloween. She came as a slinky. That was her costume. I thought, whoa, that's pretty creative. I like that. I've never seen that before. But I remember the first time I saw her. Oh my God. She was coming down the stairs. Wow. 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 Ah, oh, she's amazing. She's taking two at a time. She's pretty good. She's pretty good. Has she not gotten stuck on the bottom step? I never would have talked to her. Never would have talked to her. But wow, yeah, we hit it off. Do you know this is true? She went home and she told me this. She immediately called her mother and she said, Mom, I just met the man I'm going to marry. And I went home and I told my wife. I said, Honey, I just met the woman I'm leaving you for. <laughs> Two totally different reactions right there. Totally different reactions. <laughs> She's really sweet. She cares about me a lot, you know. She was gonna give me a she was gonna give me a defibrillator. John, you know what that is, John? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shock paddles in case you have a heart attack. I have no heart issues at all. But uh, she was worried about me. That's why I married her, and she's so sweet. And then she priced them and thought, well, maybe it's not worth it. <laughs> Wait till we start having some problems. And then maybe, maybe, <clears throat> maybe we'll do that. It is kind of patchwork, isn't it, as you get older, John? You ever had any surgeries? Yeah? 
collective, collective, or it was a regular? Yeah. What did you have done? Five hernia surgeries. How many more you got coming up? Any more coming up? How many are you trying for? How do you have five hernia surgeries? That's a bad doctor right there. Did he miss it? He missed it the first time, and the second time, and the third time. One worked out well and two failed. What about the other two? You forgot about those. I had my, this is, I stand before you right now with a totally replaced left knee. And you know what? I feel like a 21 year old who's been in a horrible water skiing accident. I was looking at the curtain earlier. I thought, this is an old crowd. And then I realized I'm older than you guys are. <laughs> But yeah, I've had a couple of joints replaced. It's uh, arthritis. I tell people it's from playing football, but it's genetic. My mother had uh, a lot of arthritis. But she did play football. She did play football. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, when you go through TSA, I'm sure some of you had some joints replaced. When you go through TSA security, I can't go through the regular machine. I gotta go through the big x-ray, the big boy one. And, I go through that a lot, so I have a, they know when I point, a little signal, they know, that. They know, they know. After having a few of these done, it's like a third base coach giving signals to the first base runner. <laughs> <laughs> so get this, have you got a minute? I go to the hospital, I'm used to it, I go there a lot. I know what's going on. They little prep room, they get you ready, put the gown on, ties in the back. They hook you up with that IV, and you feel so good. They pump that stuff into you, you love everybody. Everybody. You think that everything you say is funny. Like tonight, like tonight. And you just, and I thought of an opening line for the surgeons, because they know I'm coming, they're expecting me. I like these, uh, Hospitals, because you get a lot of attention. And I never get attention. I never get attention. And so, uh, so I go, uh, they're wheeling me to the OR, and I got my opening line ready. I'm gonna make them laugh. That way they'll like me, they'll do a good job. <clears throat> they push me into the doors. I see them over there. They got the green scrubs on. You know what, you've seen TV. And they got the Crocs, and they're sorting out the tools. And I see them, and I'm so excited. I go, hey, you guys work here? And then I was out. I was just passed out like that. I didn't even get to enjoy the laughter, probably, that came you know, from them. I was just, and then I wake up. You wake up in the morning, you're in the hospital room. You know what happened. And I expect them to come running into the room. You're awake, good, that thing you said in the operating room. Well, you old guys work here. Of course we work there. You knew that, but you, that was why it was funny, you know? Uh, but no, they never came in. They never came in at all. They didn't even check in on me, nothing. But get this, the nurse comes in and he says to me, that's right, John, he. Catch up. He said, have you had a bowel movement yet? And I thought, that is the worst icebreaker ever. <laughs> Did you have a bowel movement yet? Who wants to know? Who are you talking to? What's the word on the street? I said, no, I don't think I've had a a bowel movement, yeah. Unless it happened in the OR after my opening line, that would have been a good follow-up right there. Oh, he's a physical comic. I like that. Props. I like the props. So uh, I said, "What do you? What, what's going on with the whole, uh, you know, bowel thing?" He goes, "Well, it's our policy here at the hospital that we can't send you home unless you've had a bowel movement." And coincidentally, that is the same policy they have here at this club. <laughs> True. You'll see. You'll see. I said, well, I don't think I've had a bowel movement. He goes, okay. I said, what happens if I can't have one? He goes, I'll give you an enema. Right then, there was a little movement in my bowel. <laughs> but not enough to send me home. I needed a bigger movement. And uh, I said, well, you don't need to give me an enema. That would be awkward. A guy giving another guy an enema. No, thank you. Goes, no, I do it all the time. It's my job. I said, well, take a break. You deserve a break. <laughs> 
this, and I'll take care of this. I know what I'm doing. I've been doing this a long time, believe me, a long time. And so, yeah, sure enough, two weeks later, I was out there. Yeah. All good. All good. Man, ah, right, let's get started, guys. <laughs> I bet there's been a lot of good concerts in this room. I bet over the years. Um, boy, that's a, you hear what uh, P. Diddy's gotten into a lot of trouble. Did you hear what P. Diddy did? I don't know if P. Diddy would do that. Did you do that? So get this. And then I gotta get out of here. I, um, I stopped at Starbucks today. It's the last time I'm going to Starbucks. It's a ripoff. Five dollars for a tall coffee. Come on. It's really a small coffee, but they call it a tall coffee. They figure psychologically, you know, you won't care that much about spending five dollars on a tall coffee. But it's a small coffee. So, today I ordered a tall coffee. And the guy goes, five dollars. I gave him a dollar. He said, I'm sorry, it's five dollars. I said, well, I call that dollar five dollars. <laughs> That's my tall dollar right there. It's my tall dollar. He said, you want me to leave room for cream in your coffee? No, not for five dollars. Fill it to the rim, baby. Put the cream in my mouth and mix it when I get home. Mm. What's your name, young man? Which one? John. John. You're Michael. Huh. You had me fooled there for a minute, Michael. I was like crazy about two Johns in this room. And how about you? What's your name? Teresa. Teresa. That's a great name. Any kids? Two. Two? What are their names? Sean and Evan. Sean and Evan. Those are good names. My nephew's name is Echo. Isn't that a cool name? I thought that's a great name. You know what his middle name is? Echo. <laughs> you know what your last name is? Co. Is that Echo, 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 Echo. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't usually apologize. I'm not good at apologizing. You a good apologist? Yeah? How do you start off your apology? I'm very sorry for what? For whatever happened. So you don't really know what happened. If they don't like that. You gotta let them know exactly what happened and why it's your fault. I'm sorry for whatever happened. <laughs> I don't even know it's me, but uh, whatever happened, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take the blame for it. I'll take the fall. Here's how I used to start off my apology. Now you listen to me. <laughs> Say it was with my prayers. Now you listen to me. <laughs> Get this. I went to CBS Pharmacy last night. Place is totally empty. Nobody in there. I thought, what's going on here? All the lights are on. Is this like one of those movies where all in the storage unit you know, they're being robbed or whatever? All I needed was two rolls of paper towels. I grab those, I go to the cash register. There's not one cashier up there. Nobody's there. I go to the self-checkout. I gotta go to self-checkout. That's how I gotta pay for these things. When do we start working at CVS Pharmacy? You know I mean? They're gonna have a stock of the shelves pretty soon and give it flu shots. We're not qualified to do that. So I scan my two little rolls of paper towels, you know? And then it asks, would you like any bags? I go, no. But I take 10, because that's what they owe me. They owe me 10 bags at least for the work I've done. And then I realized I forgot to get my toothpaste. Ah, so now I gotta go back to the toothpaste aisle. On the way to the toothpaste aisle, this customer comes up to me. He said, do you work here? I said, yes, apparently so. He said, what time do you close? I guess when I leave. I guess whenever I leave, then it's up to you. You're working the second shift. He said, do you know the condoms? I said, aisle six. Aisle six. So I go to the toothpaste aisle. All the toothpaste is locked up. Do you notice that? They lock up the toothpaste. It's crazy. What is it? Like, what, what part of the meth recipe is fluoride? You know what I mean? 
and I can't get to the toothpaste because of the plexiglass and the lock, and there's nobody around with a key to come over to help me. I'm the only one working that night. And I don't have a key. So I ended up picking the lock with a toothpick, ironically, and grabbed my 10 tubes of Crest, put them in my bags, and I was out of there. Now, here's the dilemma. Am I supposed to show up tomorrow night for work? Or, you know what I mean? I just don't, I think people are slowly letting us do the jobs at these places. You know, they're slowly checking out, slow. Let them do the cash register. Okay, that's good. You know, let them scan their own credit card before they, you know what I mean? Even at concerts, they want to do less work, these bands. They're trying to put it on us. No, no, we're not in the band. We're not in the band. We're not gonna be on the tour bus later, that's for sure. Jeez. I had some crazy jobs growing up. I worked at Dunkin' Donuts for a while, making donuts. And then I wanted an uh, electric guitar, so I got a job as a uh, lifeguard down at the local beach. Um, so one was a night shift. Dunkin' Donuts was 10 to 5 at night. And the um, lifeguard was uh, 10 to 5 in the afternoon. Not a good combination there. Night shift, day shift, lifeguard. I slept through three drownings. <laughs> One of them at Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> so get this. When I was six years old, I had kidney failure. And it was horrible. My parents were devastated. And miraculously, some guy donated his kidney to me. Out of the blue, I never met the guy. It was such a miracle, and I was so grateful. And to this day, I consider him my very best friend. And I've never met him. He lives in Seattle. And last week, I decided I was gonna go see him and thank him in person. I found a great uh, ticket online, um, Southwest. They left at nine in the morning, it's perfect timing. Nine in the morning, I got in there at uh, one o'clock in the afternoon. And um, come to find out that that is sold out, that, that ticket. Very disappointed, but I'm not giving up because without this guy, I would not be alive today. So I found another uh, ticket online, uh, United. I was leaving LA at three o'clock in the afternoon, stop over in Phoenix, and then into <laughs> Seattle at, uh, I think, nine o'clock at night. He's not my best friend. You know what I mean? This guy is not my best friend because I never really met him. So how can I say he's my best friend? And he doesn't even know I'm coming. You know what I mean? He's not expecting me. So if I didn't, you know, but. I do need to thank him, and uh, I'm not gonna, you know, be inconvenienced by that, you know. So, um, I found a flight on United. Um, stop in Phoenix, and then a stop in San Francisco, and then into um, Seattle, I think at 11 at night. I don't even know this guy, you know what I'm saying? I don't know him, it's not like he specifically gave me his kidney, he just threw it out there for grabs, I happen to get it. <laughs> So that's sold out too. I mean, I didn't know Seattle was this this uh, popular. I found another flight. This one was, um, I think it was American Airlines. Left Los Angeles at two in the afternoon, um, flew into Ontario, and with a, an hour layover there, and then back to Phoenix, and then um, straight into Seattle, getting there at one in the morning. Now I'm like, fuck this asshole. <laughs> He can have his kidney back for all I care. I don't even want it anymore. I'll be on dialysis. I don't care. I will give it back to him personally. I would do that if there was a decent flight getting me in at a reasonable hour. I'd give it to him. John Carroll and Michael and Teresa. That's right. What, is, what happened? What did you thank somebody for? She said Teresa. Shit, that's crazy. Isn't that crazy? She remembered. Ah, oh, life is good. <laughs> life is good. Do you know that I followed the love of my life, my sweetheart, to San Diego when I was 23 years old? She didn't know she was my sweetheart or the love of my life. She didn't know me from Adam. She could not pick me out of a police lineup if she wanted to, which proved to be true, by the way. 
<laughs> yeah, so I went down to Seattle. She got a job in a little cafe um, in Old Town. She was working uh, Monday through Thursdays from 9 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. And on Friday, she worked the evening shift from 3 to 9 o'clock at night. On Saturday, she went to the park between 10 and 12. <laughs> and then Sunday, she did Pilates in the morning, about 8.30 to 9.30, sometimes 10 o'clock, with uh, her girlfriend. One time, there was a guy. Uh, I'd like to ask you to leave, please. Thank you very much. So yeah, I would go down to that cafe every day, and I just just gaze at her, and I thought I was being discreet, but um, one day, out of the blue, I get served a restraining order. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she's thinking about me. For what? I wasn't stalking her, I was binge watching her. If anything, I was binge watching her. Well, guess what? I ran into her two years ago, and now she likes me, she's a fan. She's been binge watching weeds or something. So I served her a restraining order for her stalking me. Anyway, I think it's going well. I think it's going pretty well. <laughs> so stressed out lately. You may think I'm a little spacey right now, but I've been doing this a long time, and I'm dead inside. I'm totally dead inside. <laughs> but I am stressed, and uh, why shouldn't you be stressed, right? <laughs> Things that are going on in life. Uh, I eat a lot when I'm stressed. Do you? Michael, you eat a lot when you're stressed? <laughs> Thought so. What do, you, uh, what do you know? Everybody eats a lot when they're stressed. What's your favorite food? Look at me. How can I help you if you don't look at me? Potato chips. Good answer, good answer. Let's see if that's on the board. Yes, yes it is. I like sweets. Oh, when I'm depressed, I eat so much cookies, cake, ice cream. I love it all. Chocolate, 95% chocolate, John. 82% chocolate, I don't care how many percentages, 72, I'll dip my toe into some milk chocolate if I have to. I will eat 100% of all those percentages with no qualms. If I were to come over your house and you brought out a platter of warm, homemade chocolate chip cookies, which I would expect, I would. I would eat every single one of those cookies with no shame at all. Even online, when they go accept cookies, yeah. Yeah, and I accept milk. <laughs> My wife said to me two days ago, she goes, those pants are looking a little tight on you. I said, yeah, because the heater is too hot. The dryer, the heat of the dryer is way up high. You gotta take that down a little bit. She goes, no, I think you gotta take down the amount of cookies you're eating, maybe. I've been wearing the same size pants for the last 30 years in this room. And she goes, well, you know what, you're getting older and those getting a little tight on you. And I like to prove a point. So, I dug up my cap here. <laughs> dug up his cat, Pierre. Oh, I unraveled him from those jeans. And I pulled those chains on, and oh, guess what? A little tight, a little tight. But that cat lost so much weight. Oh my God. And I'm not just a sweet guy too, I like salt. I'm a salt and sweet guy. Some people are one or the other, no, both for me. Popcorn specifically, you like popcorn? Who doesn't like popcorn? You ever been eating popcorn at somebody's house and start wondering if their popcorn bowl is also their throw up bowl? <laughs> I always think that, I can't. Because it is in our house, I'll tell you that, that's for sure. <laughs> so yeah, salt, sweets, alcohol, not so much an alcohol guy. Yeah, just a couple glasses of wine every once in a while, not a big deal. I had a couple of friends that had some serious problems. Well, first of all, when I was 25, I went back to Florida to visit my parents. They lived in Florida, and it was on the holidays, a couple of buddies of mine, and we go in the house. My father's very congenial. He said, do you, uh, you guys want some eggnog? Yeah, okay, great. 
You want a little uh, rum in those uh, eggnog? Sure, Dad. Sounds good. Better yet. Goes into the kitchen. He comes out like two minutes later. A tray full of eggnogs. I take a sip. It was the most disgusting thing I've ever tasted in my life. Oh, my God. I thought, what? what? I said, Dad, did you check the expiration date on this eggnog? He goes, yeah, I got it yesterday. I went to the refrigerator. It was obvious that he mistook the carton of egg beaters for the eggnog. <laughs> they look identical. We were puking rum omelets all night long. The other uh, incident I had was with my friend uh, Steve. Oh my God, this guy hit rock bottom. He was so, we were worried about him. So we decided we would do an intervention. Me, his ex-wife, his ex-best man, and uh, another buddy. And um, for someone who was confrontational at first, that intervention is the worst thing ever. I did not want to do that, but we love this guy, so we put together a little group. And we were all, all nervous about it. So we actually ended up having a couple of drinks before we went over there. <laughs> and then we had a couple more. And by the time we got to his house, we were trashed. We were so hammered. Oh my God. We forgot who was supposed to go to rehab. We're pounding on the door. We get inside. We're trying to get him to party with us. Come on. Come on. We ended up calling the cops on us. We're just trying to help him. We were calling the cops on us. One of us ended up in jail overnight, another one in rehab, not him. And um, the ex, uh, best man, his ex-wife hooked up. And he was the designated driver. Take a break, we'll be right back. <laughs> so yeah, that is, uh, that is, but you know, stress, it's like, it's different for everybody. You know what the most stressful job in the world is, by the way? Air traffic controller. But, not if you don't take it seriously. There's always a but. I grab my teeth at night now when I sleep. God damn it. Any other teeth grinders? Open mouth breathers? Yeah, you guys? You wear the night guard at night? Yeah, yeah I wear the night guard. I wear a night guard on the top and a retainer on the bottom because they're getting crooked from grinding so hard. And then six months ago, I find out I have uh, sleep apnea. So now I gotta wear the face mask with a hose pumping air in and out all night long. On top of the night guard and the retainer. I've got all of this apparatus going on right here. It's like a pile of metal. Looking forward to a good night's sleep. My wife comes in and she looks at me in bed, she rolls over, she goes, Jesus Christ. The emoji face. She said, this is like sleeping with somebody in ICU. And then I start getting all jealous. I go, how do you know what that's like? Are you seeing somebody that I see you? How much time do they have? <laughs> Any notion of me having an affair again? What's that gonna happen? Just <laughs> think about getting a dog. I see these videos of dogs. It just looks so calming. You know what I mean? They are, right? They just relax you for some. I was gonna get a bulldog. My friend goes, don't get a bulldog, for God's sakes. They don't last that long. They're so inbred over the centuries. They're just screwed up. Their organs are all messed up and they can't breathe. They have trouble breathing. And, and you know what? I researched this. And he was right. They really struggle. And they get that underbite too. Like that, you know? And they just struggle to breathe. It's sad. Get down and listen to them sometimes. They sound like this. Help me. Help me. And I know that dog will be fighting me for my retainer. With that face mask and nobody get any sleep. Oh, this is taking forever. Oh, let me tell you what I got. Uh, oh man, I love this thing. I thought it was a gadget for the longest time. It's a uh, Toto heated toilet seat. Anybody have one of these? You have? Who has one? You got one? Oh my God! How great are they? How long have you had yours? Two years. Two years? Man, you'll never get rid of that, will you? Oh, I love it. You gotta get one, you guys. It's just, it's, I'm on it all the time. I mean, it doesn't matter if I have to go or not. I, that's where I'm gonna be sitting right there. You can't get me off. I'm surprised I'm here tonight, to be honest with you. And it's so warm. This thing, it heats our whole house, this thing. And the spray, that's the main, that's the main, you know, event right there. That spray coming up from underneath. 
And I'm telling you what, bullseye every time. Every time. And mine's got like three different settings. I don't know what yours has, but they're all pretty intense, right? Even the most gentle, it's called fire hydrant. That's plenty for me. I don't need the other two. The next one up, colonoscopy. No thank you, I have a doctor for that. The top pressure? Fracking. <laughs> Our water bill's gone up $500 a month. I don't care. I don't care. No, it's got a blow dryer. You got a blow dryer in yours? I was gonna say, your hair looks really good tonight. <laughs> yeah. What's up? Got a remote? You got a remote? Oh, I got the deluxe, I guess. But what's a remote for? It didn't come with a TV or anything. I mean, everything's right here. You don't gotta get up, you know what I mean? And then I realized what it's for. It's to prank your friends the first time they come over. They don't know. You got that spray coming up. How would they know? I take that remote, I wait around the corner, I give them like 30 seconds to settle in, and then I frack them. I hear a loud scream in there. And then it's quiet for like a half an hour. And then I frack him again. If I ever move from that house, I'm taking that remote with me. And occasionally, I will drive by that house just to see if somebody is home. I don't like those automatic flush toilets. It doesn't give you a chance to inspect your work. Do you know what I mean? I mean seriously, you turn around, it's gone. Where, where'd it go? How do you know you don't have blood in your stool? Or a tapeworm? You don't get the, where's my car keys? You know? But I guess people forget. People forget in life. I forget. Carol forgets. John forgets. Michael forgets. Teresa forgets. And that's all. I flew into Chicago last month. Yeah, last month. I forgot my laptop on the plane. I was livid, you know how I get. Oh, I couldn't believe it. I remember walking away from the gate. I even heard the announcement. If someone has left a valuable item on the plane, please come back and claim it. And I remember at the time thinking, how can people be that stupid? <laughs> well, my laptop. You know who was on my flight? You know who was on my flight? John Hamm. The actor John Hamm. <clears throat> that was pretty cool. I was gonna say hi to him, then I thought, eh, I don't wanna go back and coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, it's, not my, it's not my thing, you know? I work too hard. Too long. I was asked to uh, throw the first pitch in at a Dodgers game against San Diego, actually. Uh, it's about 15 years ago. And I was really flattered that they would ask me to do that at Dodger Stadium. And I hadn't flown a hardball. I mean, I haven't thrown a hardball like in 20 years. And I thought I better practice before I do this because I've never been so nervous before in my life. I mean, this does nothing for me. Like I said, I'm dead inside. But that, that is like everybody's watching you throw, you know. And uh, So my plan was that morning to go to the park and find some guys playing baseball or whatever and just get in the game or whatever, throw the ball around a little bit to them. And I go to the baseball park, uh, to the park, and nobody's playing baseball in there except for this father with like a six-year-old son playing back and forth. And I didn't see anybody else, so I asked the father, I said, hey, do you mind if I throw the ball with you a couple of times? And I know this guy thought, oh, this poor dude, he never had the father like I am to my son, and he wants to like have that moment in his life, you know? So he threw it a couple times, you know, throw it back and forth, that little six-year-old standing on the side like, well, that's too bad, you're not throwing the first pitch in the game, you know, I'm the one doing that. So then I felt bad. I left, I went to the park, and I was so nervous. Dodger Stadium, they gave me Jersey. I get up on the mound, and I was shaking, literally shaking. I wind up, and I throw that ball, strike right down the middle, fastball. It was amazing, it was so great. They played me for the whole game. I got to play the whole game. I hit five guys, but still, it was fun. It was a lot of fun, good times. I bet I'd be a great dad, you know? If I was home more with my kid. I thought I would be. No, seriously, I think I would be. But obviously, 
this is, you guys are much more important than me nurturing some child. <laughs> when he was 10, he recognized that I was an older father, and I was. And I never anticipated that he would be upset about that. And I came into his bedroom, and I could tell he'd been crying, and I felt horrible. I said, what, what's the matter, buddy? Because I don't know his name, I'm never home. <laughs> And I've just been thinking, I'm 10 now, and you're 63. When I'm 20, you're gonna be 73. When I'm 30, you're gonna be 83. Not gonna be an awful lot of my life, are you? Oh. I said, buddy, buddy, buddy. That's his fucking name. I said, I'm gonna be around for a long time. I'm gonna be around for a long, long time. Don't you worry about that. I'll be around when you graduate. I'll be around when you get married, when you have kids. I'll be around for all that stuff. But you gotta make that happen in the next four years. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. He said, no, I'm serious, Dad. Dad, he doesn't know my name either. Nobody knows anybody right now. He said, there's kids in my class in fifth grade. Their parents are in the mid-30s, and you're 63. I said, okay, let's stop right there. That means absolutely nothing, and it does mean nothing. Because you don't know how long you have. There's no prediction, there's no guarantee. And I tell him that too. I said, who's to say that your friend's parents in their mid-30s aren't gonna die in a fire and car crash tomorrow? That could happen. That could happen. Or a murder-suicide, am I right? And by the way, I said, who says you're gonna outlive me? You don't know that. I said, no idea. Some murdering clown could come into your bedroom tonight and strangle you with a blown arrow. You died in a dentist chair, for God's sakes. It happens a lot, believe me. I just gave him a little kiss on the forehead. I said, you get a good night's sleep. We'll talk about this in the morning. If you wake up. Yeah, life is unpredictable, that's for sure. I lost a couple of really good friends in the last few years. And that's, you know, I know some of you have probably gone through that. And it's just devastating. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, you just have to accept it. I had a, I wasn't going to talk about him, but I had a, um, my friend Tom Rosbicki. Tom and I, Tom and I met in third grade, and we were like brothers. I mean, we just everything connected. You know, same friends, same vacations, same schools, same jobs. And um, a couple years ago, he um, went in for uh, just have something on his back checked, and we all thought, "That's nothing." Yeah, go ahead, be safe, do it. So he goes in, and they did some scans, and uh, I guess an MRI, MRI, whatever, and um, and then they found out that it was. Uh, it was, it was terminal, and uh, I mean, that's like, came out of nowhere, and um, it's just, how do you process that? They gave me three months to live. How do you, you just can't process, you can't wrap your head around it, it's just so, and so I just decided that I would just love on it for every minute of those next three months, every second, and I wish I had done that all of his lives, you know, and I, it just, it's, sometimes it's just too late to kind of, and, um, We had a party for him. We had a, this amazing party. We had his favorite songs. We had his um, favorite food. I mean, we just did it all out for him. And we danced with him and we hugged him. And we said goodbye to him. And that three months came quicker than any of us wanted it to. And he was still alive. <laughs> Four months, still alive. Five months, six months, he's still alive. Seven months, still alive. Now he's embarrassed that he's still alive. Eight months, nine months, ten months, eleven months, twelve months, he's still alive. But then on the evening of December 20th, 2020, at exactly 5.32 a.m., he was still alive. <laughs> But now he's not coming outside of his apartment because he feels like a fraud. Yeah, I get that. We spent a lot of money at that stupid death party of his. And here he's all like, hey guys, what's going on today? What's going on today? You're going on. You're going on and on and on. What's up with that? You're supposed to be dead. Well, guess what? Two weeks later, I have a little birthday party for myself. He shows up to my birthday party wearing braces. <laughs> The 
next day, he goes off to the Bahamas. And I'm thinking, okay, hold on, maybe he's gonna see where he's gonna spread his ashes. No, he got a timeshare in the Bahamas with his new fiance. Well, wouldn't you know, three months exactly from that day, he did die, thankfully. <laughs> but not from the disease. It was a total freak accident. Oh my God, he was hit by a car. I was texting and driving. I did not see him at all. I swear to God. First time that's ever happened to me. And I hit him hard, too. I hit him really, really hard. Twice. I had enough in for the braces. I wouldn't even know it was him. I wouldn't know. $7,000 worth of damage to my car, 7,000. How do you process that? How do you make sense of that? You can't, you accept it, and you move on. But I love that car, I love that car so much. Just walking around it, I get to the front, I'm looking at the front, I notice that Tom's braces are embedded in the bumper of my car, that's how hard I hit him. I hit him so hard, his braces are in there. And I thought, wait a minute, Wait a minute. Why not leave the braces in the bumper so you can straighten it out by itself? <laughs> and I did. I did. I did. I did. I When my grandmother died, it was a total surprise to us because, well, she'd never done that before, to be honest with you. <laughs> but she was 101 years old. And she was in a nursing home the last year of her life. And this is true, I swear to you, this is true. She woke up two days after her 101st birthday and she said to her nurse, she said, today is the day I'm gonna die. She said she knew it. She got up, she put on her favorite clothes, went to the cafeteria, had her favorite breakfast with her friends and came back to her, her room. And sure enough, blew her brains out with a 357. <laughs> How does she know that? You know, how, that's really, uh, uh, when people know that kind of stuff, they're like, what? <laughs> you can go on these websites, you know, they can, like these hereditary what, ancestry stuff, ancestry.com, whatever they're called. It's like 90 bucks, they send you this, uh, this little kit, it comes with a test tube, a little saliva in there, you seal it up, you send it in. Three weeks later, you get back all this information about your ancestors and where they're from and the medical issues they had. And sometimes you can skirt around that stuff. It's good information to have. I thought, wow, I'm on board for that. So um, I did the 23andMe one because I thought it was a dating site. I'll be honest with you, I'll be honest with you. I did. I did. You can imagine my disappointment. 90 bucks it costs, 90 bucks. I couldn't, they sent it to me, it's out in the mailbox. I remember that morning, I couldn't wait to get it. Get this, on the way up to the mailbox, I noticed that somebody had spit on my car windshield. I was furious, you know how I get. I thought, who would spit on my car windshield like that? And then I realized, for $90, I can find out exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I scooped it up, it's worth 90 bucks for me. Scooped it up, put it in that test tube, sealed it up, sent it in, waited three weeks. Four weeks. Finally, I got back to the information I was waiting for. Turns out, get this, turns out it was bird shit. <laughs> Somebody spit bird shit on my car windshield. <laughs> this company is so good, they told me exactly where it originated. It came from a seagull from Northern California. <laughs> 30% sparrow, 10% owl. That's a party bird right there. Michael, where are your ancestors from? Real quick, then I gotta get out of here. Ireland, Germany, that's a great country. That's when they were together. So Ireland and Germany. You look more German than Irish. Can you speak German? Can you speak Irish? Where do you think you're going? I'm uh, from Ireland originally. Well, I'm not, my ancestors are. Which um, made me eligible to get an Irish passport, which I do have. And, uh, but it wasn't easy getting that passport. Some of you might have tried to get one. It's just, you gotta jump through so many hoops. You gotta fill out all these forms. You gotta get these certificates. I had to get my grandfather's uh, death certificate, which was not easy, because first I had to kill him. 
<laughs> they happen to have a 357 Max. <laughs> and we're back, ladies and gentlemen, if you just joined us. We're here in Solano Beach, California. Uh, I want to take more risks in life. You know, I'm sick and tired of playing and saying, God damn it. You know what I mean? Get out there and do something. Not crazy risks. I'm not going to skydive. Or take a carnival cruise, that's for sure. <laughs> hey, did you read about this skydiver a couple years ago? This guy, he was crazy. He was more than a risk taker. This guy went up through the Earth's atmosphere, 24 miles up in the sky, and he jumped out of a hot air balloon with just a parachute on. That's insane. This guy was free falling for almost 24 miles before he pulled his cord. He was, this guy broke the sound barrier. That's how fast he was falling. Broke the sound barrier by himself. John, do you have any idea how fast that is? He was falling faster than the speed of sound. And it's a good thing his chute opened up, otherwise that would have been a big mess to clean up. Oh, can you imagine? They would be cleaning him up and then they would hear, oh shit! That's a thinking bit right there. A thinking bit. Sorry, Michael. So get this, and then I'm out of here. I came back from the pandemic when it was over. I wanted to make sure it was totally over before I went home. And some guy broke into our house. This guy smashed our back window. He came into the living room. He's got like, I keep saying he, but it could have been a she. I don't want to be sexist. <laughs> yeah. um, so this bitch comes into our house. Right? <laughs> there was a person, I don't know who it was. But, uh, in and out pretty quickly though. He took just a couple of things, a couple of handbags and a couple of watches I had. I don't collect watches, I don't collect anything, but these watches were really sentimental to me and I really, um, it was sad that they took them, but one of them was a watch that I'd given my father right before he died. And I mean right before he died. I go, Dad, I want you to have it. Oh, okay, back in the pocket. The thought that counts, I mean, you know. The other one was a watch that uh, well, Michael's from us, and I want to give it to me. Both gone. And, but the thing that I cherished the most, that was the most sentimental to me, was just a simple string um, that held a little urn at the bottom that held some of my friend Tom's ashes in there. And the crazy thing is, Tom gave me those ashes before he died. That's how guilty he felt about not dying. He was slowly cremating himself as a down payment for not dying. Do you know what I mean? That's not Tom, though. That's Gary Shandling. True, true. Gary was a good friend. One of my favorite jokes Gary Shelling did was uh, sometimes when I feel lonely, I'll shave one leg so it feels like I'm sleeping with another woman. <laughs> so get this. And then I'm so out of here, you wouldn't believe it. You wouldn't spin your head. I'm walking by my primary bedroom. That's right, John, primary bedroom. <laughs> and my wife is sitting on the side of the bed, and she looks really sad. I said, what, what's the matter, buddy? What's your fucking <laughs> She said, you know what she said to me? You know what she said to me? I go to her, I go, what's, what's, what's going on? She was like, I was just thinking. I'm 24 now, and you're 63. <laughs> That's not true. Not totally true. Sort of true. Not that true. I didn't rob her from the cradle. You know what I mean? Bunk bed, maybe. Yeah, bunk bed. We have a uh, we have a hall pass agreement. Do you know what that is? We could be with one other person for one night, no questions asked. But I realize you have to update your selection. You can't write somebody's name down on a piece of paper, stick it in the drawer, and then pull it out 10 years later thinking you're going to collect on it, because things change. I looked at mine, Mary Tyler Moore. <laughs> My wife's, Bruce Jenner.
who I used to know. I would see Bruce all over LA when I first got out there. He was the first celebrity I ever saw. He was at the beach, he was at the driving range, fundraisers, and we got to know each other. We also often uh, you know, have conversations together. We were just a couple of Olympians chatting. It's all we were. It's not like a big deal. We get off of it. Come on. But I only met uh, Caitlyn Jenner like five years ago, and somehow she knew me. <laughs> but let me, uh, let me just share my thoughts about this. The whole, I applaud people that really follow their conviction and you know, know that there's something amiss and they go in for the surgery and all that, but I just don't know if I would have the wherewithal to do that, to go through the whole process with the surgery. I've been thinking about this. John, you think about this, don't you? <laughs> I know you do. Do you know what I mean? It's certainly something you don't want to rush into. Because what if it's just a phase? You know, you wake up in the morning, oh, what did I do? What did I do? What? An enema? No, no. Here's what I would do. I would dress like a woman for a couple of years first. I mean, that makes sense, right? I mean, come on, duh. And then after like a couple of years, if I'm still cool with it, then maybe I go in for the surgery. Maybe. But gradually, I do it in steps. Here's what I would do. Okay. I would start off by removing one testicle. Don't throw it away. Remember where I put it. Six months or so later, if I'm still okay with it, go back for the other testicle. Don't throw it away. Put it with the first one. Keep them both together as a set. Six months or so later, if I'm still okay, then I go back for the penis. Again, gradually. Here's what I would do. I would remove an inch a week. And after 10 weeks, if I'm still okay with it. Then I go back for the other half. Thank you guys very much for coming out tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. You guys rock. Thank you so much.